For those of you who are just hopping on right now, I, I've admitted a few more folks late into the session, but I'll continue to do so. A few housekeeping reminders as you're on the session. This is a recorded opportunity for us to later present this, share this with you. It'll also be posted on our YouTube website, our YouTube channel that we have for our center, the Native Center for Behavior Health, which houses our Addiction Technology Transfer Center, our Prevention Technology Transfer Center, our Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, Mental Health with K through 12, and a Trauma Stress Child Initiative Center. So we have a lot of great opportunities to share information across the country with people who can't always be on the line or come to a session with us. So know that if you have a friend or colleague that you want to share this with later, you'll be able to do so in a couple of weeks once it's posted to our YouTube channel. But after today's event, you will be given a copy of this recording, as well as some additional materials, resources to help support you in the field of native nutrition. Today's opportunity is sponsored by our prevention office. My name is Dr. Allison Bays, and I serve in this office as a program coordinator. Tapilam Kovitekan Nation is where I am from. My homeland is back in South Texas area. And so I want to say, Nalit Sam, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to give you just a little bit more information about our presenter, and then I will gladly turn the floor over to him so that he can share his expertise, his knowledge, and so much more. You see him on the screen, but I found this lovely picture of him online. There's a lot. If you just Google him, you will find him. He's with a Red Cliff Band Ojibwe. He's been working with food systems for many years and across many communities, indigenous communities across the globe. Even though he's from the States, he has taken the time to actually travel and learn about other people, other indigenous populations in regard to food security and sovereignty language revitalization, seed saving, food cultivation, culinary arts, and so much more. He works in Minneapolis with the Division of Indian Work as a Nutrition Program Coordinator, and he does have a degree in Economics, Global Business Management from the University of Minnesota in Morris. And with that, I want to turn the floor over to him. He has privilege to share his screen, and he has a lot of great information to share, and it's going to make you hungry once you see all these pictures, so be ready. Oh, thank you for the kind words, and it's my pleasure to be here. I love to be able to share my gift and be able to speak to everybody, and I love being in the community, so anybody that's watching, feel free to reach out to me anytime, and I'd love to get to know you and connect with you. So my name is Derek Nicholas. Um, I'm Rick Cliff Band Ojibwe, which is a reservation way up in northern Wisconsin, right on Lake Superior. And I think that's one reason why I just love the water so much is because that's where my people come from. I wasn't born on the res. I was born in the Milwaukee area. I had a nice family. I have both parents and an older brother, a younger sister and a younger brother. So I kind of fall in as that middle child. And we didn't grow up too much in the culture um, my great grandfather was a boarding school survivor. He got taken off the res with his siblings and it was hard for him, the boarding schools. And he ran away at nine years old and came back to the res and all of his family was gone and dead. So at nine years old, he had to make a life for himself. And he moved to Ashland, which is about 25 minutes south of Red Cliff. And he started working for the railroad company. So. Just imagine being nine years old and having to figure things out for yourself. It's probably a quite traumatizing experience. Anyhow, he may not have had uh, the greatest character. He had his whole second family that no one knew about. So during his uh, funeral, my grandma, there was a mystery woman there. My grandma was, she didn't tell any of my, my dad or my uncles and aunts who this woman was and but people were curious like who's this mystery woman right and she was like oh that's his second family and so it was a kind of a big shock and that was one reason why my grandmother never passed on that information because she really resented us uh being native and well resented him and did not want us to follow that path or be 
native because native wasn't necessarily cool back then. It wasn't, it was hard to be native. So she was doing everything that she could to kind of take us off that path. So none of those teachings were sent down to my dad or my uncles and aunts or none of her grandchildren like me or my cousins or whatnot. So I've been on this path to revitalize this knowledge within my family and to empower my family with this knowledge and get back into our culture and walk in a good way, a way that we were supposed to. So I'm very new to this community. I've been working within the native community for about five or six years, specifically working in the food system. But it kind of started when I moved out to college. I went to University of Minnesota Morris and it used to be a boarding school. So we have a lot of uh, native programs where there's Native American studies. We uh, teach Anishinaabe Moan language, Lakota and Dakota language. So my first introduction was doing that Anishinaabe Moan. I was taking those courses because I wanted to learn the language and I wanted to learn more about my culture because I knew I was native my whole life and I really wanted to dive into it, but I had no community. My family lost all that knowledge. So it started at school actually. And I was taking the language courses that first year, my freshman year. And during this, throughout the school year, I was looking for a job and a position opened up in the Native American gardens. So I applied and I got the job. So I started working and managing the gardens. We had an organic garden and a Native American garden. And it was, it was a really fun time because I got to connect with the land, put my hands in the soil and heal through that. A lot of people don't realize that working with the earth, pulling weeds can be therapy. It can be rejuvenating to one's spirit. So I was really, really into it. And people were saying I had a green thumb. I was growing some really nice foods and the foods that we were growing were heirloom seeds, seeds that were passed down from generation to generation, native seeds that have never been cross pollinated. They had the true genetics, their integrity kept with them. And when we got these seeds through the indigenous farming conference, uh, this conference that would be held at the Maple Log Resort up in Callaway over by White Earth. This past year actually that lodge burnt down so they had it in a different location this year. So that was, that was a lot of fun because I got to learn the stories, the songs behind those seeds, and then be able to grow it and cook it. Each year we'd host like a community feast. So we were in the small town of Morris and we invite all the community in and share about culture, which I wouldn't do because obviously I was very unknowledgeable at that time, but I was able to cook the food and share the food and be able to see the reaction that people had. We're like, whoa, this gate to summon squash tastes like candy. That's one of my favorite native seeds is that gate to summon. You know, it was this lost seed, but they found it in a clay pot underground and they've been able to revitalize that seed. It's a big old squash. And it just, man, it's so sweet and it's just so uh, delectable. That one always sticks with me. So I continued working in that food systems and that position was only made for freshmen, but my supervisor uh, really liked me and she kept advocating for me to be able to continue the work. So um, if you see me looking around, sorry, this, we got a couple of spirits that live down here. We got like a little Ojibwe girl. She'd be like running back and forth this way. And then in this dish pit area, there'd be like some big dark guy that'd be kind of spooking me out sometimes. I actually had one of my coworkers, she's fairly new to the organization and she asked if she can cook today, come downstairs and do a little something for herself. I was like, yeah, go ahead. Kind of got her all set up. Next 20 minutes later, I get a call. She's like, hey, is there something down here? I was like, yeah, yeah. It's back by the dish pit. She's like, yup, I keep hearing something. So you see me looking around, that's, uh, that's what I'm probably looking at. Um, but where was I? Yeah, so working with the food systems, she, she kept advocating for me to get funding each year, which was, her name was Mary Jo Forbord. Uh, she's a white lady, but she's an ally. She's always uh, supporting our native communities and 
really, uh, really helping us. I mean, she helped me a lot on my journey, learning about why organic food is important, why we should be having bison instead of cows. And it was really uh, inspiring and she helped me a lot. So I give her a lot of credit for getting me started in my work that I do. So each year I tended that garden, but in the summertime I needed some more work to do. So we had a farmer's market and I noticed that a lot of our families, our native families are low income and couldn't really afford the produce there. So I went to the Board of Commerce and requested EBT SNAP funding, which was approved. So I became the EBT SNAP coordinator and I started, um, we were able to give out these market bucks and double the bucks. So people had double spending power and were able to get those healthy foods. They might not have been culturally appropriate, but they're healthy and organic and fresh. So that's very important. Um, and then our food shelf closed. This was during the pandemic, probably 2019, 2020, something like that. It closed because all of the managers were high risk population. They're a little bit older. So me and Mary Jo, we stepped up and took manager positions of that and we kept that food shelf going. And during that time, I was wrapping up my time in school. So I started trying to gather my information that I've learned and accumulated and create a resource. And that's where I came up with that, that short little book, that field guide called Eating with the Seasons on the Shinabe Great Lakes region. And I just wanted, I had it in mind to kind of create it for the community, but also for myself, because it was something that I wish I had when I was learning about our foods. And it's like a nice little book. It's really short. And it has a couple recipes for each moon, the 13 moons. And they're like seasonally appropriate recipes. And they also includes uh, Anishinaabe moon cultural lessons and language. And so during that time, I finished my book right when I was graduating. And I um, have eBooks available for free because I didn't want there to be any barriers or for people to access this knowledge, to access this resource. And that's one thing that I do is create resources for a community, but I make sure that there's always an option to receive that for free because native people, we already have enough barriers and we shouldn't be like knowledge keeping from each other. But at the same time, we have to be really respectful of the knowledge because we have a lot of sacred knowledge that shouldn't be shared. You know, we have Reed is alive and well in this capitalistic world that we live in. So people are always going to try to make a buck off things. So for example, we have plants that they help shrink tumors. And nowadays, everyone's going out and foraging that plant. And now our native communities don't even have access to it. This plant takes, it only grows on an injured plant and it takes 30 years to grow. So it's not even a sustainable thing to harvest. It's, you only harvest it for people that need it. But now it's, it became a fad and now all the Mukamin know about it. So it's, it's hard to find. So when I work with these elders, my teachers, it requires a lot of trust because they know I'm an author. They know that I like to create education resources for the community. But you have to be respectful and knowledge of their things that they're sharing with you and you can't let it get into people's hands that are gonna abuse that. So working with these elders requires a lot of trust and respect. And it takes time to build that trust and respect. And the best thing you can do is just walk in a good way and they'll see that. So I published this book and so soft cover copies are available for sale because you know people want a physical copy of a book sometimes, but then the ebook are completely free. And that's what I try to do with all my resources. I always have a free option. So at that time I was graduating and I was looking for what am I gonna do after graduation? You know, getting into the real world is a little bit scary because what job am I gonna do? I wanna love my job. I wanna make sure it's my passion. But at the same time, I wanna be able to make a living and not be able to struggle so much. Am I walking on this right path? This, 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 and that. So it requires a lot of prayer. I pray every day, asking for guidance, asking for me to take the next right steps, whether it's with my job or with my finances or with my relationships. Um, that's so important to live a holistic life. We talk about that medicine wheel a lot. 
and that's physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional. And you want to be in balance with all of those. You want to sit right in that middle. And that's that's walking in a good way, walking on that red road. So I had a relationship with Sean Sherman. I was part of the World Touch Heritage Community at University of Minnesota Morris. So I was part of bringing him into our school to do some activities and lessons. And I was able to establish a relationship with him. And I was asking him for advice. So I thought I was interested in this food world. I wanted to be more a part of it. So he invited me to work with the Indigenous Food Lab. So I was working there for a bit and I got to learn a lot more about our native foods. You know, I got to learn how to harvest and work with beaver or work with venison, ducks, bison. Um, so I was able to develop more skills on the culinary side. It was uh, such a gift to be able to work with them because I had learned a lot and it was such a good organization. I love what Sean's doing. Uh, for those who don't know Sean, he's from Pine Ridge and he started the Indigenous Food Lab and now he has that restaurant in Minneapolis, Alamany. He just won Best Chef of the Year and Best Restaurant of the Year. So I was there for a short time, maybe six months, and I would love to stay there longer, but I had somebody send me an application to here at DIW, Division of Indian Work, and it just seemed like the perfect fit for me. They're looking for a nutrition program coordinator, somebody to cook for the programs, somebody to lead um, cultural activities around nutrition to working with elders to revitalize our lost food systems. And I felt like that was kind of what I needed because at the Indigenous Food Lab, I was more of a culinary, uh, uh, what was the term they used? Uh, blanking on the name, but, you know, I was like a help with the prep, you know, making uh, meals for uh, tribal communities. So we did a lot of hunger relief because this was during the pandemic. So we were making, man, I forget, the, I don't want to like misspeak on the numbers, but it was thousands of portions of soup. Maybe uh, if, if I speak wrongly, please forgive me. I think it was around like 10,000 portions of soup like a week. And we distributed to all like the tribes in Minnesota. So like Boys Fort, Prairie Island, um, kind of those different communities here in Minnesota. So moving to DIW has just been such a gift, such a privilege. And I'm going to kind of talk about my journey from there on out and the work that I do now. So if I can figure out this share screen, I'll switch to this. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so here I'd be working at DIW and as the nutrition program coordinator. And then I also started my own business, uh, Wisnig LLC. And that is a platform to showcase my food sovereignty work. And it was kind of like an umbrella for, I put my book under there, you know, kind of as like an umbrella and I'm working on my next book and I create a lot of educational resources and maybe I'm going to quickly pull up my website so you guys can actually see it because I'd love to show you the work that I do on here. Yeah, so this is my homepage and I kind of just briefly talk about what we do. So some of the stuff we do through my personal business is I lead cooking classes and demonstrations, doing like food pop-ups, food service, leading cultural exchange trips domestically, internationally, and classrooms. So something that would look like would be maybe the Iteso tribe from Uganda. They have their youth on a computer and I have my youth here at DIW and they're doing like a virtual thing like this. And they may each be playing their drums, sharing their songs. And it's very empowering for the kids because a lot of tribal kids, they think that they're alone. They think that they're the only ones walking this way, that uh, they don't really have many people to connect to. But there's tribal people all around the world, and there's so much similarities and overlap. So it's very empowering for those kids to see. Um, I also do kind of presentations, um, production and sale products, which not really a thing right now besides my book. Uh, I kind of do have some things in the works, but it's if I'm doing it, I want to make sure it's right and done in a good way. So I'm still kind of planning on that and then creating resources. So, yeah, I believe that doing this work is kind of a way to offset colonialism because we've been so affected by that. You can see it a lot in our food system. Food was a way to control our people. You know, you saw that 
all the bison were slaughtered because the bison was the way of life for the Plain Indians. They used every single thing, whether it was hide for clothes or for their uh, wigwams or bones for tools and the meat for nutrition. And then the same thing here for my people up in the Great Lakes region, they cut off down all the trees. So a lot of the animals didn't have a home. So for a while, we were just kind of snaring rabbits. And that was, this, the rabbits were so generous at the time. And that's kind of where that name Ojibwe came from. So we do a lot of work trying to revitalize our traditional practices, mostly around food. And we make sure that we're doing this in a good, safe way to avoid greed and the exploitation of that. And there's the little bio. So some of the work I do, I just have like an Instagram page where I kind of showcase the stuff that I got going on. So here you can see me advertising for today's event, you know, trying to bring in some people. Uh, last Tuesday, I did a food sovereignty event with Hope Flanagan, one of the elders. My teacher, uh, she's so great, she's been so generous to me. She works at Dream Wild Health, she's Seneca, and she's very knowledgeable about the plants. And I've been so gifted to be able to have a relationship with her and she's been such a great mentor to me. Here's me last weekend, we had like an educational powwow going on. So I was doing some indigenous food tastings, had some like acorns, some sumac, uh, sampling out some nettle hummus, and then also sharing about our DAW programs. And then also just kind of show, showing people what I'm up to so people can get inspired to go do these things. So right now here it's sugar bush season. So over at Porky's, we're harvesting that sap, boiling it down, making sugar, making syrup, which is such a hard process to do. It's so rigorous. And that's one thing why our foods are so expensive because it takes a lot of time and effort to get our foods, to process our foods. And I feel like that is one major barrier for our people to being extremely healthy is because the foods that we're supposed to be eating, that healthy, culturally appropriate foods are the foods that are hard to access, whether it's finding it in the store or actually going out and harvesting it yourself. Because if you're going out and harvesting it yourself, you have to be knowledgeable about what plant can I pick, what plant can I not pick, learning the skills, how to uh, trap, snare, hunt. And then after you get that animal, do you know how to butcher it? So it's, it requires a lot of work. And then I just kind of just share some of the food that I make. So my, my hope I was just talking about, she's always foraging. So she brought me some sea purslane from Florida and I made like a salsa verde out of it. So it's just kind of all being creative. And this is kind of one of the ways that I, uh, I try to inspire the youth. And I just kind of like having this up here have kind of some publications so like articles that I'm in that people can read about you know when I'm in a podcast or on radio or tv and then the resources this is the interesting part this is the fun part right this is what people want to learn people want to know so look at this we got some whitefish bone broth lesson and whitefish bone broth is actually maternal medicine it helps with uh, lactation flow and other benefits for postpartum women and women that are also during their pregnancy. So this is uh, one of my coworkers, Shoshana Craft, and she'd be leading our, uh, our women's and doula traditional birthing program. But then she also has her own business like myself, where she supports uh, women that are pregnant through lactation resources and whatnot. So we have a, a lot of different videos where we talk about cool things, you know, these nettles, food, medicine, utility. That was what I was uh, doing last week over at that powwow, I was showcasing off those nettles because not only it's food, but it's medicine, you know? It's uh, very high in vitamin K and iron. So it's gonna make you nice and strong. And then also it has that utility. So right now, if you went out in the winter time, you can find last year's stalks and you can pull them out of the ground. You can uh, twist it like twine. And that's how we used to make our fish nets or bags and whatnot. And that's uh, where net lake comes from because all the nettles that grow in that community. Making some wild rice portage and talking about the teachings of wild rice. We have so many different varieties of wild rice. I didn't even know this, but Hope brought in all these different varieties and was showing the difference. And I think that would be a lot of fun to learn more about that because 
they all taste very different. They all have different profiles, whether they puff up more than others, because you can puff up while there's like popcorn or just the taste, the look. Yeah, this is the rice camp over at Mille Lacs. I've kind of shown how they process their rice. Underground oven, this was really fun to do. Uh, we have uh, our storytelling season's over because the frogs, they came out. Um, we have like a lesson that we do the storytelling, the Adazukan in the winter time. And when you can tell those stories when there's snow on the ground, but once when the frogs return, start croaking, start singing, that's when we stop telling our stories. So we have a trickster story. It's called the shut, shut eye dance story. And I was kind of emulating uh, the cooking process of that. Talking about native teas, medicinal purposes with that. And this is probably my favorite video, the rough grouse. I did this one with Hope Flanagan as usual. Hope usually me and her do a lot of collaboration with each other. Uh, she's a really good friend of mine and I love her so much. But we took this rough grouse, it's the Benet. This is kind of like the original bird. You know, we have Benet C, Benet She, the little birds, the thunderbirds, and the Benet, the kind of the original bird. And she kind of talked about the two medicines inside, the crop, which is like in the neck. You can blow that up like a balloon and it'll have its old food in there. It's usually like the birch pollen cones or the hazel pollen cones. And you blow it up, tie it to a stick and you can make a baby rattle. And then you can take that gizzard, which is right in that stomach. It's where it grinds up all of its food. And you make a little incision, turn that inside out and you hang it. And it looks like a pucker toe baby moccasin. And you wear that as a charm to be a good moccasin maker. So we showcased that. And then I cooked a dish, the grouse using all four ingredients. So nothing was bought from the store. So the salt, I used colt's foot as a plant. Sometimes it was referred to as Indian salt. You just dry it and you burn it and you can shift through the ashes and it has a high saline content. So I use that for my salt substitute. Prickly ash berry, it's a, family of the Szechuan peppercorn. So it's got that, that fiery bite to it, that peppercorn taste or a little numbing on your tongue. And I had some sage. Um, what else I had? I did like an elderberry syrup. And then I also took some mountain ash berries and uh, kind of boiled that down. They're very bitter. So I boiled that down in like a simple syrup with water and uh, maple sugar and created a very delicious, beautiful dish. And I think that's what it's all about when it comes to food sovereignty is just having full range of control when it comes to our foods, being able to do it sustainably, do it the old style way, how our ancestors would have done it. But sustainability is a very big, uh, it's very important in this world because whenever we do something in my uh, culture, in my community, we think about the seven generations, we think about seven generations to the past, and how would they do it? And then we think about seven generations to the future and will they be able to do this? So we wanna make sure that we're doing it in a sustainable way so that our youth have access to this. And then some documents. Um, I have like an indigenous food pantry guide. So it's kind of something that you could take to the grocery store or your co-op and be like, oh, what are some good substitutes that I can bring into my household? So maybe instead of going for that chicken, maybe you're gonna look for a duck. Maybe instead of going for that beef, you're gonna look for some bison or anything like that, you know, getting some nuts and berries. That prayer, I have the prayer right here, the one that I led through today. You can view that yourself. And then the shop. Don't have nothing on here yet. I've been I've been doing like a lot of jewelry stuff lately, you know, keeping my hands busy when I'm at home, making some stuff. So I might put something up on there, but otherwise, right now it's just my book that you can purchase. Otherwise, you know, that free ebook that you can download as well. And then, you know, we got the contact page, Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. Um, so now I'm going to shoot back to my presentation. Kind of moving some stuff around so I can see what I'm looking at. Yeah, so I kind of talked about this a little bit, what, I, what we do. So working with the youth, this is very uh, important. This is over at the St. Luke's Presbyterian Church. 
they have a little garden over there, which they uh, they grow food for me each year. And then they bring some of that produce that I can cook for our programs. So they have their kids at their church. Uh, I don't think any of these kids are native, but I was able to go in the garden with them, show them what plants am I picking, when to pick them. And we were able to create a delicious salsa. So when kids get to see where their food's coming from and then learn how to cook it, they're a lot more open to trying it. I was just recently over at uh, Wachoye, which is our immersion school over at uh, here in Minneapolis it's for native kids. And I, <laughs> it's immersion, so I can't speak any English at all. I brought these kids over a um, cedar bray smoked duck some sockeye, some smoked sockeye salmon from Alaska that was smoked by the Kodiak tribe. And I also took that skin off and like I uh, crisped it up, you know, fried it up all like, you know, and these kids were young and I brought it over there and they were just devouring it, which was very new to me because here at BIW, our kids are a lot older and they're not immersed in the culture as much. And when I bring these foods out to them, they're like, no, I'm not going to try that. And even our youth workers, the adults, they're, they push back. And I feel like that discourages our kids as well. So introducing these foods at a young age is very key for them to be able to continue trying things new, continue eating our traditional foods. And uh, I really want to stress on that because I think that's very important to teaching our kids at a young age how to harvest food, how to identify food, how to cook food, and just being brave enough to try these things. So actually at Wachoye, I wasn't here for that day. I've only visited them once. But Hope was telling me that um, Liz, the worker there, she brought in a bear heart and she brought in Skittles. And the kids, every single kid wanted the bear heart. For me, my kids here, if it was up to them every day, they would have pizza and hot Takis. So it's a challenge to try to feed these kids our foods. You know, just yesterday I had uh, my bison order come in and I did a unique order. I got some bison tongue, some kidneys, some bones, some, uh, some oxtail. So I'm going to be creative and I'm obviously not going to tell them what it is, but I'm just going to say maybe they, they eat a lot of bison. So I'm just going to say it's bison, but you know, if I tell them it's a bison tongue they're going to be all freaked out. So I'm probably going to, first recipe I was thinking is doing like bison tacos bison tongue tacos where I just kind of mince it up really small they have no idea what it is and then I'll be like oh you guys just ate tongue did you like it a lot of ask them if they liked it first of course and I'm like oh that was tongue so ha 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 I got you but when we're working with the plants you got to be very careful you got to let them know because all of our plants are medicine and it can affect people in different ways so for me I use the wild bergamot a lot I like to take off those petals and uh, well, I use the whole plant. I make tea out of it and use it for other uh, purposes as well. But I take those, the florets off the top. I like to season my fish with that. It gives it like a nice uh, flavor. But I have an elder. She can't use that plant at all. It makes her throat swell up. So whenever you're using those plants and those medicines, you always got to let people know because everything affects people differently. It's medicine. So last thing you want to do is be like, you know, get somebody sick or hurt. This is one of our youth, Xavier. I'm here feeding him some uh, some bear that I unfortunately can't eat because I'm bear clan. Um, we don't eat our own clans. And then here's me over at Dream Wild Health being the guest chef of the week. So cooking for their programs. Uh, I'm also Lebanese. So a lot of, I was more connected with my Lebanese culture growing up. We'd always be cooking Lebanese food in the house. And one of our dishes is yabra, which is you either use a grape leaf or a cabbage roll and you roll up in some like lamb and rice. But I made the indigenous version using bison and wild rice. So that was a lot of fun. And so here I was kind of talking about just connecting with your elders. This is uh, Elder Bill Schaff and he's taking me to his community and I was helping him harvest some swamp tea, uh, some mosquito bug, that's what it's called. This is really good for COVID for those that uh, may be going through that. Um, here's a good gang. Here's Hope Flanagan, that lady I was talking about. She's just so generous and so kind and shares her knowledge. But the thing about harvesting our foods is that community is so important. So these acorns right here, I uh, 
Pope was telling me a certain spot where to go harvest it because there was a tree over at Bedema Pasca that was under a lot of stress. They were doing construction around the tree. So the tree just wanted to share its gift, share its life, and it was dropping these all of its nuts like fast and early. So she was saying, oh, you should go harvest these. So I went over one weekend, biked over there, grabbed like a bag like that. And it took me a while to go harvest that. But then I went back the next week with those group of ladies and we harvested so much so quick. And then we started processing them and, you know, cracking every single nut, making sure that the nut's good. Sometimes they have like a acorn worm in there, uh, which is kind of fun to try. You know, I'm always trying new things. So I popped a little grub in my mouth. So, oh, well, I got a little bit extra protein. But it makes sense to do these things in community because it's not always easy and it's not always fun doing it by yourself. Just imagine me being hunched over, just cracking these shells for hours and hours and hours. Just it's kind of gets, it's a lot of work and it's hard work. Hard work is good work. And so it's important. But being able to go in community, we're able to sit down all together, share stories, laugh, talk about, oh, how are you going to cook these acorns? Are you going to cold leach them? Are you going to hot leach them? And it was just a fun time. Here was some turtle that I had, some snapping turtle that I fried up two different ways. Uh, some apios americanos, that's uh, our wild potatoes. I think this is gonna be one of our new foods. It's starting to pop up all over the place. Here's me cooking in on, over like a bison ribeye or something. So yeah, connecting with our elders. Our elders are our teachers. They have so much to share and they're going fast. Um, our elders are starting to go. We've lost a lot of our first language speakers already. And it's the first language speakers that we should really be learning from, connecting from, because they think in a whole different way. You know, there was uh, some lady trying to write up a book and she wanted this elder to talk about spring. And she's like, can you say, uh, what was the line? What's that line? It's like April showers brings May flowers. Is, is that correct? But she wasn't going to say it. And she was like, uh, what did she say? The eagles fly where the two rivers meet. And they, oh, completely different thinking. So learning from them is the way to go because they don't have that colonized mindset like myself does. You know, I'm slowly trying to decolonize, whether it's with my lifestyle, with um, my food. So it's very important to learn from our elders as much as we can and honor them and their gifts that they have to share. So working with your hands is also very important. Um, one thing that I really believe is an idle mind is the devil's playground. Just sitting at home, sitting on this thing. Oh man, it's so toxic, right? So I'm at home right now. I've been scraping my asema, making my tobacco for my offerings, making drums, making jewelry. Um, just something that's actually kind of productive, something that's gonna to continue to better myself, continue to educate myself, empower myself, instead of uh, being on this phone, you know. There was a prophecy, it was called the one Eye God. This is a prophecy was foretold kind of a long time ago. Prophecy kind of goes along the lines is that, that there's gonna be this one Eye God and everyone's gonna worship it. Everyone's gonna bow their heads and worship it iPhone, iPad, iPod, iTouch, the one eye. Everyone's bowing their heads worshiping this thing. That prophecy came true, you know, right after that prophecy was told that first, kind of like the iPod came out. So here's me making like a birch bark basket, you know, to carry food to winnow with. You know, our birch bark has so many gifts to offer. Here's me helping out building the lodge, sweat lodge. Um, I asked if I could take a picture. He said it was fine as long as the sacred fire isn't going. So always being very respectful. You know, you want to ask before you do and make sure that the person that is kind of uh, running things where you're being a guest, that you're honoring their way. Because my traditions aren't as being Anishinaabe, being Ojibwe from Red Cliff isn't the same as being Lakota or being Blackfoot or all of our tribal communities. So it's always very important to listen and to be quiet and to respect people in their ways. Here's me doing some sampling. This is like a wild rice salad, sharing it with the community. 
Oh, you're harvesting some strawberries, which is a lot of fun. There with an elder and her kids. Some more sampling. This is through my business. I did like a 200 meal for 200 people by myself. It was quite some work. And then the school had some volunteers to help uh, portion the food. I just kind of dropped it off, you know. This is that rough grouse video I was talking about. So in that video, Hope's talking about a couple plants that are emerging. Those are the day lilies, and actually they're popping up right now. They're not native, but every plant has a gift. So um, it's you just kind of have to learn that gift and acknowledge it. And just like every plant has a gift, every animal has a gift, and all of us have a gift. So as humans, we got to get quiet enough to and walk in a good way so we figure out what our gift is so that we can be a light to our community and share that. And, I think a lot about the teaching with the beaver. The creator gave that beaver those uh, two big teeth to knock down wood, to build homes, to build up these dams, right? But if a beaver does not honor that gift, it actually, teeth continues to grow and turns inwards and it actually pierces its own heart. So when you're walking in a way that's not honoring your gifts, you're really killing yourself, your spirit at the end of the day. So it's kind of good. It's really important to try to be in touch with that, to walk in all of that, uh, that medicine wheel, sit in that center. So here was that um, underground oven I was talking about. I had like a duck wrapped up in some burdock leaf. There it is. And then just going out, going out in community, trying to see as much as you can. So this was that indigenous farming conference I was talking about. Uh, Mary Moose, uh, amazing elder, she's so kind and sweet. She was uh, showing us how to break down those rabbits and then actually how to use the, those pelts to make kind of blankets or coats. Uh, it was done traditionally old style. Here's up at my community, Red Cliff, Cannon, some venison. This is during their um, Big Boon Gabishi win, their winter camp. So we host like a winter camp and we invite the youth out there, the Bayfield School. And uh, we have a lot of elders out there teaching cultural activities, whether it's netting fish under the ice, doing traditional cooking, or doing snow snake. It's just a lot of fun. Here's me protesting line three, stop line three, protect our water, right? So I was up there bringing some food for the water protectors. And then just going out and trying to forward to learn about these new plants. These are some hackberry patties I made up. I know that uh, choke cherry patties is a big thing. So I was like, hey, I'm gonna do this with the hackberries and see how it turns out. It's really good, they taste like dates. Here's that cold split that I was talking about, turned into salt, wild plum, uh, meadow garlic. These are some bison hot dogs that I do for the kids, you know? Because like I said, you know, the kids, they want their normal foods like pizza and hot dog, but you gotta find them, gotta make it indigenous, so. The pizzas, I do like a sun choke pizza, sun choke and kale. That's a big hit. Then I also do one with like bison summer sausage and tomatoes, sunflower seeds, jalapeno, and some cranberries. I know it sounds weird, but it, it's good. Uh, wild rice, strawberry horchata. I got gifted some uh, Navajo tea, so I try to make some like Navajo boba. Uh, that was fun. That was so just always experimenting, you know, just with our foods, it's never going to end. It's going to be a constant journey of learning. Bison bones, uh, hazelnuts, uh, elderberry syrup, and some wild ginger syrup. Squash blossoms with some choke cherry jelly. Um, and then making good connections with your uh, people that you get your food from. So my guy, Tanny, he's up in Alaska and he has like a fishing charter and he hooks me up with some awesome, oh, great stuff. So this is a whole bunch of different salmon that he brought for me from Alaska. He just sends it through Alaskan Airlines and I pick it up at the airport. And man, I've got such a good relationship with him now. He's invited me to come up to Alaska to hop on his fishing charter, learn about the waters, learn about the fish, fish with them. And then he's gonna like uh, willing to drive me around to those remote communities up there to visit them and learn about their culture, their language, their food ways. Because man, those Alaskans, they got some really cool food stuff. Uh, one thing that I wanna try is that, it's like that whipped fat ice cream. 
uh, I'm really interested in that. And so actually, I should probably put this out there. If anyone has any questions, I want this to be like an open conversation. So just raise your hand. And if you have anything that you want to share or ask me, just, uh, just stop me. So actually, I was just talking to him this past week, and he's sending me some King Kodiak Tanner Crab, some Pacific Cod, some Black Rock Fish, and some Halibut. And being extremely generous, he's giving me a lot of free product. But then he's also giving me a very discounted price. Because, you know, those halibut are going for like $30, $35 a pound. I think he got it for me for probably like half that price. It's choke cherry patties. So actually just learning as I go, you can see that the choke cherries in the back, they have a lot more seed, a lot more thicker. That's because I did in the mortar and pesto. And then I was talking around to some elders. I was like... Is how, how do you do it? And they're talking about getting a meat grinder. So I found a meat grinder, antique meat grinder, and that worked a lot better. As you can see, these patties that are like up front, they're a lot more smooth compared to the ones that are in the bag. Here's me working on some bear. Black bear got hit with a car and I got gifted the haunch and then I returned all the bones and all the excess uh, to that community for them to have a bear funeral. Oof, bison burger. Um, bison burger with some mojave, some garlic mustard, which is not native, and then some burdock root that I cut really thinly and fried up, and it tastes just like sh shoestring potatoes if you've ever had that. Black bean brown, oh, these black, oh, oof, black bean brownies with mojave. This is some Lakota ceremony food, that lotus. So you can use the root, the seed and the petals, you wanna stay away from the green stuff because that's toxic. So like I said, when you're going out foraging, it's always important to learn from somebody that's knowledgeable because you don't wanna hurt yourself or hurt the people that you're feeding. And that's like some ramen that I made with that. Um, yeah, then I get such the gift to be able to travel and meet these tribal communities all around the world and spend time with them. Um, I was, these are my trips in 2022. So just last year, I went to Panama. Man, they dressed me up. Oh my goodness. So I was surprisingly, I'm not even that big of a guy, but I was like the biggest guy there. So they hooked me up with that breech cloth, breech cloth and stuff when I went to go have a meeting with the medicine people, the elders, kind of like, you know, them higher ups. Man, it was so weird because First, I had a guy dressing me, you know, so I was there, you know, butt naked. This guy's going between my legs, getting me all situated. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then it was way too small. So, I, you know, my butt cheeks are hanging out and, you know, they're calling me Embrya Blanco. Uh, this was the Embrya tribe. So, like, white, white Embrya. Uh, so, <laughs> and then I was, like, learning their food system. So, like, they harvesting, like, sugar cane. They get a lot of uh, tilapia from the, the river that they live on. They live deep in the rainforest. That, so I had to actually take a dugout canoe deep up the river to go to their communities, which was an adventure itself. And uh, we brought some educational resources for the kids, you know, coloring books. And they really appreciated it and had a fun time coloring. And so, I mean, uh, it was definitely some Anishinaabe language book coloring pages and stuff like that. So. Here's uh, me, who kind of like the tribal elders. The guy on the far left is um, their kind of medicine man, and the guy on the far right is their chief. And they spoke a lot about it's like us indigenous people, we come from that same tree of life. So they took me in like family, which is so nice. And one other thing that I want to point out was Historians do not give us proper credit for our complex trading root systems. Historians don't know us natives. These folks, they have a community. They had the whole map of Turtle Island prior to Spanish colonialism. So these folks made their all the way up to Turtle Island. So I talked to some Anishinaabe, talked to some Ho-Chunk or whoever. So they had the whole map of Turtle Island prior to Spanish colonialism, which was in the 1500s. So let's... We, you know, a lot of our foods came from down south. Here's me gifting some wild rice, some anomen to the chief, telling about the significance of it, how it came to be through prophecy. Here are some of the women. Yeah, so they do this like uh, 
paint stuff on their face and make these geometric shapes. They do their whole bodies actually. And in the face, if it's uh, filled in, that means they're like taken. So it's like a way to respect women that are have a man, you know? And then we kind of uh, went a couple of their communities and visited their schools. So we wanted to see uh, what their schools are like, uh, the education system over there. These are some of the classrooms. The crafts, uh, pretty similar to Anishinaabe crafts, making things with their hands, whether it's beadwork, carving uh, wood figurines, or making uh, bowls and plates with the grasses and the plant fibers that are around, making dyes from the plant fibers around. That was actually those temporary tattoos was made from a plant. So here's those, those dugout canoes. We took deep up the rainforest, and which is so sad. These people don't have any land rights. They live, live in a national park, so they can't harvest any trees. They can't build onto their infrastructure. So they have to wait for a big storm to come, knock down a tree, then they hop in their canoe with their chainsaws, cut up that tree that knocked over, and then drag it back to their communities. And it's like first come, first serve among all the communities. And here's some of the foods I tried. Um, then just whenever I travel, I try to get as much education as possible. That's, I'm not so much for being out, uh, just relaxing. I'm always trying to learn. So here I was taking like a chocolate making class, learning how cacao is processed and how it's made. You can see, I think there's a little bit of chocolate on my chin because I was munching down a whole bunch of chocolate that day. And then uh, I was also in Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Uganda. I'm uh, the Education and Sustainability Board Chair for a nonprofit, Feeding Mouse Filling Minds. And uh, our mission is to provide safe and dependable food and water resources for communities. So we went out there to check out some projects, and I also had the ability to hang out with some tribes. Uh, here's me in Ethiopia, not turning anything down, my, my whole group. I mean, I was the only native one in the group, the rest were uh, Mukuman. And these people, it was a mezcal holiday, a big holiday, a big celebration, and they butchered a cow for us. And the way they eat it, they eat it raw. So they take these big chunks and just cut, cut it up in little cubes and you see the muscles still twitching. And I was like, you know, of course I'm gonna have a couple, you know, gotta do it for the culture. I'm also a foodie, I wanna try it and I gotta be respectful. Sit down, have one, have two. Uh, they just locked me in there. I probably threw back like 20, 30 of those big pieces. And as you can see, the, my group on the left, they're just kind of peering in, watching me go in. They had some more uh, American style food over there. It was like some hummus, but it was made from false banana, one of their plants. So it's always important to be open and trying new things. Uh, you know, it was kind of me that made really good relationships with this family. And, you know, they invited me to come back uh, next year to hang out with them. Uh, the rest of the group really didn't get that invitation. <laughs> they have coffee ceremony. Very cool. They have, uh, they do incense. Well, coffee originates from Ethiopia. That's where the original coffee bean comes from. All the other coffee is derived from Ethiopia. So e coffee is just kind of like wine, you know, kind of, Depending on where it grows, the temperature, it kind of affects the taste. But the Ethiopian coffee was amazing. So every day they roast the coffee beans and make coffee. They make a whole ceremony out of it. They burn incense, they smell just like bear root. And then they also go up to the mountains to harvest some herb that you can put in the tea to completely change the flavor. Very cool. So here's us, a mezcal holiday. Um, you know, these people are really connected with their culture and everybody honors it as much as they can. So it was very liberating to be out there because it was just a whole bunch of people that are trying to walk in a good way, you know, people that aren't using drugs and alcohol. You know, this, those kind of things take people off their path. Um, this is Rwanda over at a food market, which is just wild. Rwanda, they're doing some pretty cool things in the capital, Kigali. Um, some things that I wish they could do here. So they don't really let plastic in the country so much. They like really stay away from plastic. And then if you litter, you get the biggest fine ever. So nobody litters, it was like the cleanest streets I've ever seen. They repaint the roads every four months and it's just a really beautiful place. This is the market, so it's obviously a little bit more dirty. People are eating food, throwing the scraps on the ground. But at the end of the night, everyone sweeps up and the next morning it's like pristine. 
food pictures. Man, these people work hard. I saw some guy on a bike. He had like three couches on his back and like 50 chairs like stacked up all like crazy. Like I'm like, I was surprised he was able to keep his balance. But kind of being in these communities, you get a lot of more respect of how good we have it here in the States. Um, all the communities are so happy to receive us. They uh, come in with like song and dance like this. Oh man, every single time I watch these videos, they just make me smile because it's just, uh, it's just reminding me of all the good times. Everyone's so friendly, so welcoming. And they have so little, but they're so happy. Here's me getting my little two-step on. <laughs> so community is such a big aspect in these areas because that's really all they have is each other. And that's how we need to be more like. And like, there just isn't really much judgment here. You know, if like that guy right there on his like hands and knees, kind of like doing that back arch, if I like did that here in Minneapolis, so many people would think I'm a weirdo and I'd get so much judgment passed on me, but everyone here is just themselves. Uh, and it's, it's really refreshing. Yeah, so they make their own instruments. These are some like hand pianos. So if I encourage you, Connect with your communities, try to learn your songs because their songs are a way to uplift each other. It's a lot of fun to sing and dance. So that's one thing that I'm trying to learn. I just got gifted like a hand drum. Some elder helped me make one. And I'm trying to learn songs to sing, our traditional songs, not just for healing, you know, healing the water, healing myself, healing community, and also just having a fun old time. So here's uh, the Atesso tribe of Uganda. You know, they got the high drums. A lot of similar stuff. So, you know, we got the jingle dresses. And like kind of way back, we used to kind of use those, uh, like the deer toenails to make that jingling sound. And they got something similar around their uh, ankles and uh, calves. And it just doesn't stop. It's all day, all night. I find that so much of these tribal communities, they have so many teachings that overlap, so many similarities that overlap. It's just a beautiful thing. Uh, these people are extremely healthy. They have rich in culture, you know, songs, dances. Look at that food. Look how fresh that food is. They eat really healthy too. And all this comes from the land nearby. It's not, they're not buying strawberries or tomatoes that are from halfway around the world that's used preservatives to keep their color. They eat very local and eat fresh. I mean, obviously there's a lot of discriminations in these countries. That's why we're out there to help them. Like for this example, this uh, women cooperative, they 
they lack a lot of medicine and their uh, healthcare system is very bad. So a lot of people struggle I and mean, the water out there is very, it's not clean. So a lot of people get sick or need to actually buy iodized pills to put in their water to make it somewhat drinkable. So life out there isn't easy, but they're still happy. So here's me with this lady in the middle is from uh, Rwanda Water Access. And that guy on the right is the school director. And we're uh, talking about implementing some water systems at their school. This is uh, a school in Rwanda, Babongo Secondary School. I've been leading a project, a garden project over there, getting them some poultry, some bunnies, and some uh, fresh vegetables so that they can incorporate these foods into their uh, meals. I think they have about five to 700 kids and it's a boarding school, so they stay for a series of months. This is another school that we went to and they, they need sewing machines because the women, they want to make their own uh, sanitary pads, but they can't afford that. So we're like, hey, we can go, we can afford it. We went right into the market, bought one the same day, drove it back at night, and they were so grateful. So here are some of the students and teachers. Here's uh, one of the water wells that we do. And on the left, we're building like a train. I think we got a full picture at the end. Yep. So women, they actually are very discouraged to go to school because they get bullied a lot during their, their moon uh, because they don't have much privacy, but we are able to do something like that for them, get that built. This is one of the water projects we do. So this is a rain collection system. Uh, we cleaned off, uh, had like a water chute from the roof and with solar panels and that water would drop down and then siphon off. So all that sediment would sit to the bottom and then it would uh, shoot into a different reservoir. And then here in this, against the wall, we have these different filters, which were powered by the solar, solar panels that would go through. And then the last one would be like a UV radiation. So completely clean that water. And then these kids could just fill, get clean, healthy drinking water from uh, these faucets right here. Uh, here's me hanging out with uh, Kevin and James, some nice kids. And then I was just recently in Michoacan with the Prechua tribe. They were having a ceremony that happened once every 52 years and uh, I had the privilege to go. Um, so basically this is like a new year ceremony and the town was receiving a sacred fire that they'll care for for the entire year. And then next year, that new year, they'll walk it to the next community. And next year is like a four day walk. So they have to keep this fire going all year. And there's a, the fire got split up between four people. So four people in their homes have the fire caring for it. You know, in case one of, one of the people lose their fire, they can go to their other person's house and get that exact same fire back and going in their house. So next year, they'll carry it for four days to the next community. And next time they'll receive it is in 52 years. So every year when that town receives uh, the fire, they try to make a big, they try to do a big, you know, because a lot of people come from all around uh, Michoacan State, the Perechua people, uh, they come and celebrate this. So every time town is trying to, you know, show up each other, right? So here's like some men carrying the sacred fire and actually kind of the role is a little bit flip-flop. Usually the women are taking care of the fire and then the men are like, kind of like the water. It was kind of unique. So there's like some women with the smudge bowl carrying that fire. Can you spot the gringo? <laughs> I'm, I'm the gringo. I'm right in the middle, uh, right here. So it was a long walk. It was, uh, it was a fun time though, because I got to meet some people. I got to walk, and we were like walking through the woods too, right? So I was like, you know, I was trying my best to stay with them um, medicine people. I was like, hey, what's, what's that? You know, trying to point out these different plants and having them show me things. It's like, you know, drums, just like us, their ceremonies are very similar. You know, when we do a praying, they do like four directions, kind of like how we do so. And uh, same like smudging. Uh, drums so this is like the fire when that they brought the fire and this is kind of like the end celebration and everyone got a piece of that fire uh, here's us on that walk they got those conch shells to blow uh, 
here's us doing a sunrise ceremony with them. You know, we got a sunrise ceremony. And here is kind of like the day of the celebration. So a lot of different Tretua communities were coming in and kind of showcasing their like lo locally, regional uh, gifts and stuff. And then uh, here are some of the plants that I took pictures of when I was down there because I think some of the plants are the same or they're either the same or just a little bit different. So this one on the left, I'm not sure if this is lead plant, but it reminded me of lead plants, one of our uh, native prairie plants. Over here, they're harvesting some pine resin that is, uh, they mix in with their tea for uh, respiratory issues and also like rubbing into their aches, almost like that bear grease we use. This is not red willow, but it looked just like red willow. So I took a picture of it. Some of the niece hyssop. Um, this was horsetail, which my people use is kind of like a traditional sandpaper. And oh wow, uh, look, I found some sage. Huh. And they use tobacco, a same on, just like us. Um, this is like that leaf tobacco. I have some of this seed, like that pink flower and yellow flower tobacco from Grand Portage. It's pretty similar to that, not that stick tobacco. These ladies working on the corn. The community is such a big thing. So, I mean, we're hosting, it was, it was like a really small town. I think, uh, I don't wanna, maybe the population was a few hundred and 10,000 people came in the town. So everybody was opening up their homes to each other. So people from outside communities were camping out in people's backyards, you know, people weren't shooing them off. People were happy that they're coming to their town and celebrating a culture with them. And that's so important. Um, yeah, and then I kind of just, to go back to the main picture, this is kind of what I was talking about already, how I got started. This was me working in the Native American gardens, learning our food systems. This is some of that food we shared at the indigenous, uh, the community feast. So there's some of that gate de some fry bread, which is not traditional at all. Uh, it's the survival food. And we had some venison with some gravy, some wild rice, uh, corn salad. That soup back there is a the squash soup. Learning the language, very important. Uh, you know, you want them spirits to be able to understand you. Doing cooking demos for youth in the summer. There's uh, me and Mary Jo requesting for that Snappy BT funding. And then there's me with my little Snappy BT stand, serving the market bucks. There's us at the Indigenous Food Conference doing some trading seeds with my uh, friend Jesse Fastwolf from Pine Ridge. Uh, there's, there's, a book that I published. There's uh, Sean visiting our school and then shortly after me working with Sean in the food lab and be able to work with such a great team and learn some skills. And what's coming up in the future? Um, well, I'm working on my next book, but it's gonna take a couple of years because I really want this one to be done right. I'm taking a lot of time in this book. It's gonna be a real thick one, you know, hardcover and everything trying to make it all official, uh, but uh, it's going to take a lot of time because I want to do it in a good way and uh, make sure it comes out right how I want, how I envision it. Uh, so that's like my two to three year goal. My seven to 10 year goal is I want to open up a cultural camp. So I want to buy, acquire a whole piece, punch of land, you know, with a fresh water source, maybe a, hopefully a spring, at least like a lake and river. And we have uh, dormitories for uh, boys and dormitories for girls and so they can stay there whether it's a winter camp or a summer camp and that they can make friends with each other you know bringing these kids together is so important whether they're Ojibwe, Ho-Chunk, Cree, uh, Lakota, Dakota, Blackfoot, I'm sorry if I'm there's a whole bunch of tribes um, so bringing these kids together and would have a big outdoor garden or well, a big garden slash farm so kids can learn how to grow food. Then we have an indoor commercial kitchen, outdoor commercial kitchen so they can learn how to cook food. Uh, would have like a big workshop so people can learn how to work with tools and create education, like uh, traditional crafts, whether it's a jiman, like a birch bark canoe or make birch bark baskets or make bow and arrows, um, whatever, making snares and would have elders and residents. So having elders there to uh, be teachers for the kids to teach these uh, te um, traditions 
and to keep those things alive. And then all that food that would grow and cook would go be distributed to hunger relief programs, whether it's a food pantry, soup kitchen, or just uh, allowing native, native family members to come in and give some free food. Uh, that is my dream, and I'm slowly trying to work towards it. Otherwise, in the meantime, I'm continuing to travel as much as I can domestically and internationally to visit these tribes because I, I learned so much from these tribal communities, whether it's tribal communities here on Turtle Island or across the world. So I actually think next month I'm going to go back to Africa and I'm going to visit the Mursai tribe, which are those uh, folks with those big old lip piercings. They put those clay plates in their lips. They're uh, unmarried. Each year they get bigger and bigger. The hammer tribe, the ones with the clay hair, uh, the Bennett tribe, the ones that kind of like paint their bodies and go on sticks. So I'm planning on visiting them in May. And I'm um, just, I put down my tobacco every day. Prayer is a very big aspect into uh, doing these things. You know, if, if you want something, you should uh, ask for it. And uh, just, but can, you know, you should pray in the right way, you know. We don't know what's always best for us. So you just kind of ask for guidance and asking for help in the next right direction. Um, yeah, and also just really walking in a good way. You know, you have to be present. So you can't be smoking weed. You can't be drinking alcohol. You want to be uh, doing things how they should be done. And it's hard, you know. It's hard to make sacrifices and it's hard to fit into this world because all of our peers around us, they, they don't really understand our ways and they justify actions, but you can't kind of succumb to that peer pressure. You have to kind of be brave and uh, kind of trust with your intuition and just do the hard work. You just have to walk, you have to do the work and it's hard. But at the end of the day, I really believe that it pays off, not only if it's helping you to become more physically, spiritually, emotionally, or uh, mentally healthier. If that, if that doesn't happen, uh, sorry to hear it, but if you're doing good work, it's gonna help others. And that's what's most important is to give back to our communities. And I, that's all I got for you guys today. So thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. And if you have any questions, please send them in my way. I'd love to share with you anything that I can offer. Jimmy Gwich, thank you so much, Derek. We do have a lot of questions that came up in the chat. So I want to try and address them, but I'm also going to share a few more slides. If you can unshare and yeah. I'll post a few things. Uh, can you tell us what social medias you have besides the, I think you shared Instagram. What else do you have? We have Facebook. Instagram and YouTube. Okay. And you can find it all on my website, Wisenig LLC. Otherwise, you can just type in uh, Wisenig LLC and uh, it'll pop up on the internet. And my Facebook page will pop up, Instagram page, YouTube will pop up. Uh, I can type it in the chat for you guys. Yes, that would be good. As well as if you have the link to the ebook, they asked about that and I couldn't find that quick enough. Yep. So, um, so like everything's on my website. I'll put the website in the chat as well. Oops. And well, he's I'll put the doing... direct ebook link on the chat as, as well. Okay. Um, and if you want to reach him directly, I've put his email address and his website here. If you can't cut and paste it quick enough, all of this will be in the slide deck that you'll be receiving. And please be patient with us. It takes about two weeks for things to be put together and shared with the participants for the sessions. I know some of you were asking about previous sessions that you've attended. So we thank you for, for being here, but just be patient with our team that actually puts that together and sends that out for our center. Um, another question came up right at the beginning about your salt substitute. You talked about okay. something that you burned, made into ash. Yeah, it's called foot. Um... It's a little difficult to find, but you just take the leaf, you dry it out, kind of roll it up into a ball, and you set it on fire, and then you shift through those ashes and uh, it'll have a high saline content. So use that as a salt substitute. But like I said, 
Every plant is medicine, so be careful. I know them folks up at Bawan Ting, they use that as medicine. So uh, please be careful when you're doing these things. Just try real slowly and introduce it to your palate, see how you react. Thank you. Um, a really fun question, because you're all about doing demos, at least on your website. There's so many great videos of you and you and Hope and just the, the work sharing with us about how to cook differently. Someone wanted to know if you would be willing to provide a video for how to cook the bison tongue tacos. Okay, yeah. Uh, you can do that. I just made note of it. Bison tongue video. And it's real interesting that you shared that because back home, it's the cow tongue that we eat in South Texas. And our elders this last summer started teaching our youth how to do traditional cooking underground. And kids weren't realizing that it takes hours and hours for it to tend out so tender and how to clean it and prepare it, just eat. They just see it show up on the kitchen counter or on their plate and they enjoy it. Um, and they do know, most kids do know that it is a cow's tongue and they still eat it. So um, thank you for sharing that. That was really a good connection for me. And I've never even had tongue myself. So when I pull this out of the freezer, it's going to be a, something new for me. So I'm going to do some research and learn how to properly prepare the tongue. I know you got to take off that thick, thick skin that's attached mm -hmm. to it. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how it turns out. I'll get some practice in. And once I'm happy with it, I'll make a video and I'll send it this way. I'll make that resource. Well, I will invite you to consider, I don't know if you cook the whole head in your tradition that you've been doing, but we cook the whole head back home. And so besides the tongue, a lot of people enjoy eating the eyes. Yeah. Eyeballs. I've never done that myself, but I know a lot of family members who enjoy it. So something to consider. I'll look for some video or imagery to share with you so you can see that. Yeah, I know they're good. They're like gushers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Buy into in the top. Yes, exactly. Here on the screen for you, everybody, you have our website to our Native Center for Behavior Health. We are at the College of Public Health with the University of Iowa, and it takes you to all our platforms, the Addiction Transfer Center, our Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, our K-12 Mental Health Center, and our Trauma Stress Initiative for Children as well as our prevention center. And I really appreciate um, the comments, the connections, uh, Derek, that you made in regard to walking that sacred path, walking that, that journey with our creator. It can be challenging. We know that there's so many pressures out here and the field work that we do um, with prevention with our young people is very important work and it needs to be consistent because that's how our children become responsible young people and stay on that good path just like you we appreciate that um that knowledge that you share also on the screen for you you have the fifth link to our last session for native nutrition for prevention and healing and it's april 18th almost two weeks from now and this is a different perspective it's still about diet but it's looking at some of the health issues that our native people um, are impacted by diabetes and obesity and how we can change our diets, change the what we put on our plate, change what we put into our bodies and have healthier outcomes. And we're going to have an educator and anthropologist come on and share some of his experiences and doing those simple things so he can have a healthier life and how he helped his family have that healthy journey also. We have a few minutes left. If anybody has questions, I'm trying to get to this chat. Colt's foot. Is it Colt's foot? Like a, a baby Colt? They're asking in the chat. Yeah, that's that's the correct spelling. Okay. I believe it's one word though. Okay, thank so, you. Yeah. Anybody else have a comment or question? We appreciate you joining us today. And any other sessions that you were able to participate in, know that our team will put the videos together, put the resources together, will include some recipes and book links and anything else that we have found of great value in our sessions in that toolkit at the end of the series, at the end of April, you will all be mailed that 
information so that you can serve your communities. And just like Derek mentioned, um, you need to look at what's indigenous to your area, to your community, and be mindful of you know what is healthy, what is safe to eat um, as you're growing, as you're harvesting things, and look for elders to share that knowledge with you because it's important. He has great leaders here in our Minnesota area. So we've had a few of them online and we'll continue to work with them and, and invite them to share their knowledge with us because it's so important for our, our communities to keep going. So thank you all. Our last session will be April 18th. Have a great afternoon, a great weekend, and we'll see you soon. Nalit Sam. Miigwech, gigawabman. See you again.